I know a guy who gets there, and he gets there with espresso, like a great paisan. Our friend Mark Farzetta. <laughs> I, I actually just got out of the tub. So there's a there's a difference there. So there you go. Well, then you I'll tell you what, you're ahead of the game than what Nakobe is because he's still in the tub. How you doing? No, I, <laughs> you know what I loved? I loved um when Devin White was addressing the media and he was like, I'm gonna I'm gonna push Nakobe Dean. You know, he and I, we've known each other. I recruited him. When he was when I was trying to get him to come to LSU and he ended up going to Georgia and all that stuff, they kept in touch after that. He's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be the guy to really push him and we're gonna compete on the football field. I was like, all right, man. I, I hey, look, I love the attitude. Now I just need to see it. I need to see it, and we it's gonna be a minute before we see it. I know, I know, I know, but it's better to hear that than you know, he doesn't care about being a mentor or anything like that. Did you hear what Jason Light, the general manager of the Bucks, said today? Oof. He goes like this about Levante David. Let me get – here's Jason Light's quote. And I sent him a text after. He goes, Levante David, this guy stands the test of time. 13 years of playing great linebacker for us. You never have to worry about him not showing up. He's always there. Hmm. This is why we've reinvested in him, and this is why we have great faith in his ability to always be there, unlike others. <laughs> Who, who is he referring to? Sales? I don't know. Who's the guy? I don't. Hey, I, I, I was going to ask you since you're like a Nostradamus guy. Everyone <laughs> in Philly's like a Nostradamus. I don't know. Maybe fill in the gap. Yeah, I think we kind of get it. <laughs> uh, I, look, I, I I hate and I you come off to me to be a guy that also hates this phrase. I hate the you know we'll see mentality yeah. because like no kidding like that's the most like, we'll see you know like when, if you're really passionate about something right now and someone's like well we'll see I, I hate that but when it comes to a guy that the last time we saw him he was failing on the football field. He admittedly said, you know, that's out. Hey, look, I hope it's out of character for him. You know what I mean? I hope that last year was out of character for Devin White. As someone who really likes the Eagles when they win football games, I really hope Devin White was just, oh, yeah, I, was, I just had a year out of character, right? Uh, I hope that's the case. But I also hate that word hope. Yeah, hope, exactly. I hate it, too. I hate it, too, because it's just having hope is a terrible strategy. <laughs> so when it comes to a guy like uh, Devin White, I, I, I look at it like this. The best thing he said was reset button. They, he can reset. Kenny Pickett used the same thing. Different circumstances here, obviously. But, yeah, you know what? If you're a player worth any ounce of playing time, you, you're out there to prove it, especially in the NFL. I don't care if you got a, a five-year deal. I don't care if you just got $26 million guaranteed and you're Saquon Barkley or if you're Devin White and you took really a $3.5 million deal, not a $7.5 million deal, but it could be worth up to that, then you better you better be out there to prove it. Because you're going to get that opportunity here in Philadelphia to prove it. To prove that, yeah, last year, flash in the pan. It's not really how I am. I'm better than this. Not just in pass coverage, but also in run coverage as well. Run stopping as well. Go All right, fine. Prove it. Because we're not going to get that opportunity to see it until he does step foot in the football field. But, look, whatever he was selling, I'm all right. I like what he had to say. We're not going to see him prove it until he gets that opportunity. And that's, unfortunately, all the way in September in Brazil. Of all places. Yeah. Um, will the Eagles regret bringing C.J. Gardner-Johnson back? I don't think so. No. No, they will not. I, I think that there is a very important thing. You think in he duplicates 22. That's going to – that's a pretty high bar. You got to think about it, you gotta think about it like this. And the NFL in interceptions. Yeah, yeah, and he missed uh, – he only played, what, 12 games that year? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And he was in a four-way tie, I believe it was, with six interceptions by the time the season was over. Came back and played well. But here's what we're looking at. People got to remember that he, when he was with the Saints and the Eagles traded for him a week before the season started, he had never played safety in the NFL. He was I safety. thought it was the week of the season, Mark. Uh, the season yeah. opener, wasn't it the beginning of the week? They traded for him like on a Tuesday, and he was ready to rock on Sunday. I thought it was like really right there, squeezed at the – right there. I, 
I remember it. Yeah, it, it, it was either like it maybe was, after the last cuts, right? Like something like I thought like that was there. It was. I would have traded for him. I know. Yeah, I, I would say yeah. I think it's somewhere in the range of like six to eight days okay. before okay. the season started. It's bottom line. It was he just got fitted for his uniform and then played. Like that's <laughs> yeah. how it went. Um, but people forget that he was a safety. I mean, they, they realize he was a safety in college. Nickel corner in the NFL with the Saints. And then comes here and he's like, by the way, you're our starting, you're one of our starting safeties. Uh, okay. And he only played at a Pro Bowl level when he was here in Philadelphia. And that was in the Jonathan Gannon scheme and all that, which is very Vic Fangio-esque. And, and I think I've said this to you before, but the thing that I really like about CJ GJ is that it, th there's, th there's going to be no pleasantries with him. Like if Chauncey Garner Johnson was on the Eagles team at the end of last season, Oh, there would be Ooh. no, there'd be no innuendo. Like Between there'd be no. Him and AJ, I would have, for as a talk show host, I would have, oh. I would have bought tickets to that. Uh, you can, like, so AJ did the thing where he's like, I got nothing nice to say, so I'm not saying anything. And I, you know what? I respect him for it. That gene does not exist in Chauncey Garner Johnson. That does not exist in CD Deuce, my friend. It does not exist. <laughs> So it's that there's going to be no pleasantries. There's going to be no read between the lines. There's going to be a flashing neon billboard huge sign that says, we sucked, we're terrible, everyone is straight ass right now, we need to be better. So and it comes to accountability. Oh, he's certainly a guy that will hold people accountable. But what, what matters more than anything, because I do think the Eagles are going to have a, a good season, what matters more than anything is that he's got to be the type of player on the field that he was – in Gannon's defense. In the Vic Fangio S scheme, players excel when they understand the freedom of their role. And this is what guys on the Dolphins said last year before everything fell apart at the end of the season for them as well. They have to understand the freedom. And I think Chauncey Gardner-Johnson, one of the things that he does have a great understanding. Uh, obviously, it's going after the ball, no question. But with that comes the freedom. He's able to do that because of the freedom he understands in the role he's going to play in this defense. So I think he's already got his feet more than wet. He's got his feet soaked in a Vic Fangio-esque scheme here in Philadelphia. He obviously understands the fan base. He understands a lot of what goes on in the locker room there. I look at him as a guy that is going to be a leader on this defense. He's going to tell you the things that, that you just don't want to hear. He's going to tell you things and do the things that you also need him to do on the football field. So I am excited that he is back. I think When I look at it, I am the most excited about Saquon Barkley, and after that I'm most excited about uh, Chauncey Gardner-Johnson. Enough on that, Gator. Okay, enough, <laughs> enough, enough, enough on that, Gator. Okay, sorry, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow, there was just way. I mean, I was gonna, I need a, I need one of airplane vomit bags, but Hall of Fame player, true. CJ, everything you said is true. I'm with you. I think he's a playmaker. I do. I, I <laughs> now I, let me move. So, I heard you now talking about Barkley. Okay, so I tried to explain this to people in the last hour here, and I don't think folks get this. OK, in the last two years, Mark, you've averaged twelve hundred rushing yards. Eight touchdowns, 33 catches for 250 yards between Miles Sanders and between DeAndre Swift. So the floor for Barkley to be an upgrade and to prove that it was the Giants. is. He has to rush for this to be an upgrade without Kelsey. 1,200 yards, which means he has to probably go for 1,500 to be an upgrade. No. And 60 catches for 400. So you're telling me this guy's going to be a 2,000 yard back with all those mouths to feed. And that's the, be hit the benchmark is 1,200 rushing, eight touchdowns. 33 catches, 250 yards receiving, which comes out to around almost 1,500 yards in total offense. You think he goes north of that? Look, it's going to be difficult. I think he is going to flirt with 2,000 all-purpose yards from the uh, lines from uh, yards from scrimmage this year. I think he's going to flirt with 2,000. All right. <sighs> However, my benchmark for Saquon Barkley's impact with this Eagles offense isn't going to be his own individual stats, which let's get this out of the way. If he stays healthy, uh, he'll put up numbers. But for me, it's overall impact on the offense. Will this offense as a whole take that step forward? Because look, if A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith are on the Giants and they have somewhat of a, a competent 
uh, offensive coordinator, and they have a or no, I shouldn't even go to coordinator at this point, but just in terms of competent offensive line, How about a quarterback, then, <laughs> quarterback Daniel Jones, absolutely. Then, then you're not as dependent on Saquon Barkley to have those kinds of numbers. But here, there is going to be the ball spread around. There is going to be that love. And I think anyone across the NFL, I mean, who's who's a bigger home run hitter for you? Who's the guy you got to prepare a little bit more for? Is it Miles Sanders or is it DeAndre Swift or is it Saquon Barkley? Because I'm going to think that Saquon Barkley is going to be on the top of that list for a lot of people when you're comparing those three running backs. So you throw him in the mix behind still an offensive line that I think is still going to be pretty damn good. And you also look at the idea of having a quarterback that is also in his own right a threat. That's a lot for a defense to try to break down. So, yes, numbers-wise, if you click on, you know, what is it, uh, uh, the pro football reference, and you look at his numbers, you're like, oh, wow, not that great. No, go- great, not that great, not that great. Oh, hurt, pretty good, pretty good. Oh, wow, it's not as big as it was when he was with the Giants. Well, it's because there is still a lot of ball that you got to share on, on this team. So I look at this. Here's the number I'm going to give you. The Eagles, before their second half uh, conflagration, I'll put it like Whoa. that. Whoa, hold yeah. on here. Yeah. Let me write that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, I got it. I got it. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'll look uh, it up later. Yeah, there you go. Before that was set ablaze, my friend. Holy before that God, happened. That Temple education just really disgraced my Miami education. All right, it's go the, ahead, it, man. It's the Ivy League of the North Broad. <laughs> and uh, – Anyway, <laughs> people talk about pen. Don't give me pen. Anyway, uh, so people look at it like this. I'll give you, here's the number. 28.1 points per game. That's what the Eagles were averaging before everything was terrible. All right? They were averaging 28 points per game the year a year ago when they went to the Super Bowl. If With all these offensive weapons, if they get over the hump of 30, if they get over the hump of you know become a 32, 33 points per game, if they can control the game and their their um, point differential isn't atrocious like it was last year, Sills, then I'll say, all right, this is the impact you want from Saquon Barkley on this offense. This is the impact you want with Kellen Moore as an offensive coordinator. This is the offense you really want with Jalen Hurts at the helm, having all these weapons at his disposal, all the excuses out the door, Howie Roseman dropping the gauntlet in front of Nick Sirianni and Jalen Hurts and saying, I triple dog dare you to fail with these weapons that I got you, most notably this offseason, Saquon Barkley. I'm going to lay the actions of the Eagles out, and then I'll ask you the question. And this is Hassan Reddick. So let's go back to last year. They draft Nolan Smith to take his job eventually. Will we not agree that that would be the eventual replacement? Yeah. Fast forward. They give him outright permission to find a new team for him to go to. Okay. They sign a guy on the first day of free agency that duplicates his skill set. And they want him to be Hassan Reddick when you got Reddick on the team. One more to go. Then you turn around and you take a roster bonus that was due on March 15th and you move it to April 1. Now, Mark, I don't know about you, but you and I have been in the radio business a long time. When PDs and market managers start doing things around you and you start reading the tea leaves, you know you're being replaced. <laughs> you and I know the business. Yeah, a little bit. NFL guys know the business. How are you not being pushed out of the Eagle organization, not just in words, but the way that they're acting? I think they're pushing him out. Uh, I mean, I I agree with that. Enti- I mean, the minute you say, oh, okay, all right, you go find a trade. That's like saying, we know nobody wants you. So go ahead and kick tires, man. Go, and go then ahead they and turn around and give Bryce more money than yeah. you're making. And Bryce Huff is – I saw somebody online getting in an argument about whether or not he, he's a proven commodity. He is – Bryce Huff is not a proven commodity. Absolutely he had, not. He had – I have way more questions about Bryce Huff than – than anything like can he play against the run he's getting this huge promotion you talk about the the, the workplace he's getting a huge promotion here is he going to be up to to snuff for you know the promotion he's getting to be an every down defensive end or outside linebacker edge rusher whatever you want to call it to go after the quarterback and be able to stop the run is he up to do that i already know 
the sound Reddick is up to do that. I already know the sound Reddick has had three amazing seasons. I know the sound Reddick has been in the conversation at some point for defensive player of the year. I know what a sound Reddick can bring to the table. The Eagles looking elsewhere and telling him, all right, fine. Yeah, go find a trade because a deal is a deal, man. Um, yeah, they are th not just Nolan Smith, like you laid it out there, not just Bryce Huff, but the message, yeah, go try to find somebody who wants you for a fair deal and will also give you a new contract, one that you feel is deserving. Uh, because you ain't gonna find that, man. Mark, I Sorry. don't think they've even offered him because they'd be negotiating against themselves. Yeah. Well, the only thing that I was thinking is it, it would be a It'd be a bargain price if they try yeah. to restructure restructure the deal, and then they do what many NFL teams do, which is like, "Oh, about that second year, you're cut. See ya." And that would be I, that. Yeah, I, 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 I don't believe that because again, I don't think this market is out. I, I think he's overvalued himself, yeah. and the Eagles know that, and the Eagles told him that. Let me move on. Well, real quick on that Nolan Smith thing, just real quick. If you're Hassan Reddick and you heard a then 22 year old. 22 years, 22. Nolan Smith say after his, I think it was his first preseason game, his shoulder decides to work sometimes and sometimes it doesn't. If you're a son ready, you're like, nice job, Eagles. You just got this guy to replace me and he's got a half working arm. Nice job. Publicly, and then he gets it scoped in the offseason. Publicly, Mark, I'd be saying, damn, dude. Mm -hmm. I'd call my agent and go, we got these guys. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they think they got the guy, but they don't. I've right. seen them too. This guy needs about seven Happy Meals before <laughs> he's going to be able to step on the field and take my gig. All right, now I want to go for the job chaser, and that's Kellen Moore. So help me out on this. So Kellen Moore gets fired in Dallas, and he goes to Los Angeles with the Chargers, knowing fully, fully in his mind that Brandon Staley is the hot seat coach. So he goes there and takes a job where – he knows if that guy should have been fired after the Minnesota win the way he coached that last couple minutes. I mean, if Cousins hears the play, they win the game. I'm like, you should have fired him there. He stinks. Moore knew that. He gets blown out because, hey, my opinion, if the Spanos has thought he was that good, but they got Harbaugh. I'm with you. I got it. You know, Jim, $14, $17 million. Great. He comes to a situation where another coach is on the hot seat. Nick Sirianni, this is another one of these jobs where if he does well, they're not letting him go. Nick's fired. If he does poorly, both are fired. So you really think that dynamic and that relationship, knowing full well that that guy took that job in Philadelphia to replace Nick, it's going to be one that they're going to work together. You think they're really going to be sitting? Nick knows they hired him to replace him. Mm. Uh, Are you buying it? Here's my problem. And I remember some weeks ago, maybe months ago, you had said that Nick Sirianni is not qualified to be a head coach yeah. in the NFL, right? Yeah. You are correct. When you talk about 31 other job descriptions other than the Philadelphia Eagles head coach job description, because the number one thing that is the, 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 the prerequisite, what should be the headline, the objective on your cover letter as a head coach in your application, <laughs> it should be, I'll let you do whatever you want if you're the owner and general manager. And Nick Sirianni has that as his objective. He has that on his cover letter. So come on down. So this is the unfortunate, vicious cycle the Eagles put themselves in. Again, I feel like, especially the offensive side of things, the Eagles are going to have a really good year. I can't remember a time where a head coach after a either deep playoff run, a conference championship appearance, a Super Bowl, Super Bowl win, whatever, was like, all right, this guy's fired, offense coordinator's getting promoted. I can't, other than like Jimmy Johnson with the, that was after Super Bowl wins. Other than that in Dallas, um, I don't know. I can't think of an instance that played out exactly like that. Guys have retired. Guys have stepped aside, whatever. But it's never been, you're fired. This guy's in. I can't remember a time like that. If somebody thinks of something, please let me know. But 
I think the Eagles are in a vicious cycle where they're very comfortable with Nick Sirianni as their head coach. And Nick Sirianni as their guy that, for whatever you want to call it, puppet, whatever, what is it you say you do here type of thing. And they're confident that they're then going to get another offensive coordinator. They got Shane Steichen. Then they got Kellen Moore with a failure in between with a guy that had no had no experience in Brian Johnson. I, I, I would hate it. I think Philadelphia would be, um, you know, very pissed off if they had another great season and they held on to Nick Sirianni and let Kellen Moore go coach the, I don't know, Giants or or, or maybe even the Cowboys. So, yeah, that I it's a little bit it's un, it's unfortunate, but I think it's a little bit different in Philadelphia because they do not do not have their priorities in order. Do you think this coaching staff is better than the Steichen, Gannon, Sirianni, or do you think the Fangio and more and Sirianni coaching staff wow. is an up is better. Wow. Which coaching staff would you take now? That's a great question. Obviously, in hindsight, yeah, that's a great question. Um, you put it on paper. This Eagle staff right now is set up for so much more success, being that the experience factor for one. I mean, you have a guy who's already had a number one offense in Kellen Moore. Um, Kellen Moore has experience working with a lot of different quarterbacks, especially with the year that you had, uh, what, Andy Dalton, Ben DiNucci. <laughs> I forgot uh, Big Ben. Yeah. Oh, man. Come on now. He <laughs> and literally looked real Big Ben. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I, he, yeah. Ben DiNucci. Yeah. He, so he's worked with different quarterbacks and all that. Obviously, Dak Prescott, whatever. But uh, he's worked with some different guys. Now he's getting the opportunity. He worked with Easton Stick for a lot of last season. He worked with, as we know, Justin Herbert. Now he's going to be working with, um, uh, Jalen Hurts. So he's got that experience. And then on the other side of things, Vic Fangio, 25 years. So just in the experience game, I mean, you're talking about, you're feeling a lot more confident about what you have now. At least you should be. But the bottom line is with Shane Steichen, he helped this offense reach one, you know, pretty high levels here Super and Bowl. get to a Super Bowl. So if you're and asking, got him a job in the NFL. Yeah, exactly. And you know what? I'm not going to sidestep the question. I'm going to answer the question. I'm taking this coaching staff, this coaching staff, because look, Nick Sirianni being all hands off from the get go, I think that's only a positive thing. <laughs> like <laughs> a little bit more hands on game planning with Shane Steichen, him having hands off here with Kellen Moore, less of Nick Sirianni. I feel like is more of Nick they Sirianni. Probably, he had no hands on probably on that Steichen and Gannon coach. Well, because if you remember after two and five, they play calling was taken away. Yeah. Then Steichen went and Gannon. Kind of pretty much ran the Fangio style of defense, and he was the uh, um, the consultant on the team. So he probably was in the same role he was in in the Super Bowl year that he was in a year ago. Yeah, I'll say I'll, probably I'll a like, little more influence on the offense because Brian's an experience. So yeah, and and that's that's part of it. So I think half of it is exact exactly that hands on because of Brian's an experience, but the other half of it is when Nick Sirianni officially acknowledged a year after, by the way officially acknowledged that he had given up play calling after whatever it was, four or five weeks. He said, I'm going to do the game plan during the week. Shane's going to call the plays. And then this year, what did he say? Brian calls the plays, but it's my offense. And then at the disaster of an end of the season press conference, the offensive coordinator will be in charge of the offense. Defensive coordinator will be in charge of the defense. And then when he was asked the question, <laughs> I, I hate, I mean, what will your role be? Again, bonkers that it's a legitimate question to an NFL head coach. But also, on top of that, the way he answered it, he could have just said, I'm going to do exactly what I've always done. I'm going to control the game plan throughout the week, and then we're going to have an offense coordinator you know, control the offense on game day and call plays on day. But he didn't say that. He floundered around. It's going to be very similar to what we did, but a little different. And blah, blah, blah. It was the first time we heard it's not Nick Sirianni's offense. So that, to me, is the most hands-off he's ever been. Um, and it seems like that's only going to – Seems like that's only going to continue. Yeah. yeah. A couple last questions here for you, Mark. Um, I wrote these down here too. You know, this is really now in a position where everything is in a prove it year. And I'm, I'm going to read this to you. I'm not going to go one at a time. I'm going to give you the whole collection here. Okay. And then you could, then it'll make it simpler for us here and a little quicker here. So the OC, well, he's been fired twice. He's coming into a situation to, Repair or elevate, however you want to look, Jalen Hurts and the defensive coordinator fired as a head coach in uh, Denver. Not a really good ending. And by the way, I mean, the Eagles pretty much took his defense apart. 
this past year. Mm -hmm. And that was with Brian Johnson and Nick Sirianni running an offense. And it was pretty much one of the easier games for the Eagles at the link yeah. against that Dolphin defense. Albeit Ramsey was out, I get it. There were injuries on that team. Okay. So those OCDC is kind of like on a one-year prove-it deal. Barkley, to your point, I think he's on a prove-it deal, and here's why. The thing that you say all the time, Sills, it's the Giants. They suck. <laughs> They're not very good offensively. Sills, they don't have a quarterback. Sills, he's this. I say this. Prove it to me you could stay healthy. And prove it to me like Reddick proved it to us. Hey, the Cardinals and the Carolina Panthers, they didn't know what they were doing, Mark. I'm the one that was the one that was right. He proved it with 27 sacks the last two years that they were wrong and they were bad organizations. I think Barkley's got a show. He could stay healthy. And it was the Giants. Here, Devin White. There's another guy. Um, you're 26 years old or you're 25 years old. You were the fifth pick in the draft. The Bucks walked away from you. They gave a 13-year veteran a contract extension today. They had no faith in you. And in the playoff game, you were benched for a guy who was drafted or a UDFA. He wasn't even drafted. And they got better without you. Like you said, new welcome mat, new zip code. Gardner Johnson hasn't stayed healthy the last two years. Played three games last year for Detroit. He's coming back. This was part of the thing that Mickey Loomis was saying. Hey, Bob, repost that a little bit later. Um, Mickey Loomis said this guy can't stay healthy. Great player. Let's see if he could stay on. I happen to like Gardner. I'm not saying it, but he's got to prove he can have the same impact, in my opinion, in what he had a year in 22. How about Kenny Pickett? The Eagles, in my opinion, I think they took a, they took the lesser player. They had a shot at Fields, but even Merrill Reese goes on Big Bill show <laughs> and says, "Hey, I didn't think they wanted to rattle any cages <laughs> to have it. Justin Fields on, <laughs> on the great. roster. That was great. Hey, okay, <laughs> and then like you said about Huff." Huff has proved he is not a three-down guy. You got to prove, dude. <laughs> ah, Sorry. You got to prove, dude, that you can play three downs. And look at how many of these. Well, let's see what they can do. I mean, Mark, every one of these guys at Howie signed, there's a question mark around it. Is he the guy? I mean, like you said with Barkley. Okay. Let's just go with your notion it's the Giants. Yeah. All right. Well, let's find out. You have to rush for over 1,200 yards this year to make me think that it wasn't the Giants. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you look at what they've done this offseason, what grade would you give this team and how he's handled this so far with these guys? And by the way, who they signed yesterday? Paris Hilton? He was great <laughs> in 2022. Fantastic. Yeah. We keep hanging on that 22 year like with Hurts and all this. Mm -hmm. I love that 222, man. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, hey, he was good. He had 600 yards last year. He had a scene out in yards. I mean, it was the Giants. They suck. Mm. Okay. I mean, man, we got a lot of prove it deals here. Yeah. Um, first off, thank you for allowing me to have that Johnny Carson moment of wiping tears, <laughs> tears of yeah. laughter from away. The from the Dangerfield moment. Yeah, right. Dangerfield yeah. on with Carson <laughs> every single time. Bring the next guy out. Go yeah, ahead. Right. Okay. <laughs> So what do we do now? Anyway, yeah, bring um, him out. Have you ever wake up and some kids playing with your feet? <laughs> and you're in a <laughs> hey, Carson's like, yeah, all right. I don't know. I digress. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. Here's. It's funny you bring up the the big bills thing because when I was on with him yesterday, one of the things he was talking about was the the the, the could bees. So that's similar to your point of the question marks that that are on here. I got seven of them. You got a lot of you got a lot of question marks, and I get it. Uh, for me. 
I look at the interior def- or offensive line, interior offensive line. I got more confidence in Cam Jurgens than I do Tyler Steen. I have more confidence in in, in Matt Hennessy than I do Tyler Steen. And Matt Hennessy could go go play center, and then he could you know maybe play right guard, and then Cam Jurgens stays at right guard, and Hennessy stays at center. You know, there's there's questions there. Chauncey Gardner Johnson. We haven't seen him with Vic Fangio yet. We've only seen him in the Vic Fangio cover band. So hopefully, when Jonathan again, so hopefully this time around, again, to use that word hopefully or hope, it'll be different. But you're right. They are questions. But you really can't answer these questions until the season actually starts. But when you're talking about confidence level or grade, I am astonished, astonished, my friend, when Saquon Barkley only gets a B-plus grade. The guy's a home run hitter. You put him in the lineup. He's going to help other people. If he's not hitting the home runs, then guess what? Somebody in front of him is going to get fastballs, and they're going to hit the home runs. So that's the way I look at it with that type of addition. I look at the the, the coaching hires, the coordinator hires. I think this is a better coordinator class than you had with Shane Steichen when he first started and with the Jonathan Gannon when he first started. Certainly better than Brian Johnson. And sure as hell, bet your ass better than Sean Desai. So that's a big plus. Chauncey Gardner Johnson is a, I think, a proven commodity. I will say there's questions about how we'll do with Vic Fangio, but I think for sure. Okay. But when I look at the Devin White signing, for instance, the Eagles have treated so far the linebacker position this offseason very similarly to how they treated the safety position of a year ago. Oh, Terrell Edmonds. Oh, Justin Evans. Let's throw these guys against the wall and see what we get out of it. The answer to that, you got nothing. You got nothing. Reed Blankenship is a good safety, not a great safety. He's good. When it comes to a guy like Devin White, I'll use that phrase again. You know that could be phrase I referenced a second ago? He is at least, and I actually mean this as a compliment, he's not a could be. To me, he's a has been. He has been very good in the NFL. He was a second team all pro. He's won a Super Bowl. Granted, if Tom Brady didn't go there, he probably never wins that Super Bowl. But He at least has been a good player in the NFL. Last year is a very different case. Was not a good player. You mentioned got benched. You talk about a guy who was a KJ Britt that came in and started playing for him. Like, that's ridiculous. This is a reset for him, and he needs that. I'll at least look at him not as a could be, but a has been that, yeah, could return to the previous status that he had. I look at him as an okay signing, a good signing. I'm glad he's getting that second chance, and I'm glad also that it's not $7.5 million, which just ironically enough is exactly what TJ Edwards is getting this year from the uh, Chicago Bears, a guy that the Eagles should have kept around a year ago, but they chose not to. Overall, if I'm looking at this team, defensively speaking, still got to see what happens here with James Bradbury, who I think has already played his last game with the Eagles. I got to see what goes on in that situation. But as of right now with this Eagles team, I don't see how you can't give them anything below a B-plus grade on what they've done so far in this offseason. If you include the coordinators, an A. Okay, well, then let's do this. Do you think that the linebacking core of N'Kobe Dean and Devin White are an upgrade from T.J. Edwards and Kaiser White in 22? No. <laughs> no. No, I don't. But that's something that they've never really valued. That's something that, like, I'm, like, I'm almost. Hey, that's funny you said it. You know what Herm Edwards said? What's Herm Edwards said this about linebackers the other day on our show. He goes like this. He goes, because I asked him the difference between a 34 and a 43 and what uh, Vic's going to run. And he goes, you don't have to be exceptional at linebacker. You have to be functional at linebacker. And he said, but has to be great are your safeties and corners. If you're going to be in that 34, especially Mm. because most of the time, in today's NFL, Dan, not our NFL, you're a nickel. 73% of the time, you're a nickel. So those backers, number one asset has to be covering. Well, Mark, they can't cover. They're some of the worst cover linebackers in the NFL. And you want to hear this? Ugh. Shit, you got guys starting right now who don't have higher, higher grades than Nicholas Morrow and Zach Cunningham. How is that a... A, when you haven't addressed your linebacker position. Because they've unfortunately never addressed their linebacker <laughs> position. I, and I don't say that to be funny. I don't say that to be funny, but it, I, I'll put it to you like this. Before, before T.O. was with the Eagles, like the, the, you got accustomed to Todd Pinkston and James Thrash. It was like, all right, this is what he's going to do. 
This is what Don't we're going to see. You guys didn't have a hundred catch wide receiver until last year or two years ago <laughs> in the history of the Eagles. That's mm. why you didn't value that position. For it, for I don't know what, what was it? Uh, what was Super Bowl? The Eagles lost to the Patriots the first time in Super Bowl 04. 40. Whatever, okay, so let's yeah, 04. Let's say that. So I guess that was 46 years of the Super Bowl. The only wide receiver to catch a touchdown pass in a Super Bowl for the Eagles was Greg Lewis. All right, oh, prior to Alshon God. Jeffrey. All right, oh my all God. right. So <laughs> the Eagles haven't valued that position up until recently. They obviously did with To for that year and a half, sort of. But it just got it just became something. You're all right. We're going to win games despite this. We're going to get to the conference championship game despite this. Now To is injured. Well, you're still going to get to the conference championship game, and you're actually going to win it. Oh my God! It's just the linebacker position with the Eagles has always been since Trotter a dice roll. They yeah. found – I will describe T.J. Edwards in the guys that you just mentioned. Uh, I will t find T.J. Edwards almost a diamond in the rough compared to the Eagles' standard. Zach Cunningham, I've said it many times. You mean to tell me you were that desperate to have Zach Cunningham come back from injury at the end of the season? That's what we've become? You can't wait for Zach Cunningham – future <laughs> Hall of Fame Zach Cunningham? To come, are you serious? Like That's where it's at right now? Mm -hmm. So for me, like, look, I think I, – I look at it like this. Devin White, this is his. This is going to be his last hurrah because he could be one of those guys that's just done and washed. All right, that could very well happen. Dakobe Dean, you talk about speed. He obviously brings speed to the table, but is he going to be on the table more than he's going to be? As we started the interview talking about, more so than he is in the tub. These are things we're not going to know until the season actually starts. I have a confidence in just about everything else. The linebackers, I've just kind of grown accustomed and just saying, all right, this is the way they like to do business. They don't value this position. That's that. We'll see. And I hate it, but that's the way they've they've that's the way they've uh, what's the word um, uh, Val trained us, valued hey. trained us as a fan base, whatever. I got one last question, but to me, um, Devin White's Jalen Smith. Okay, the former linebacker from Rose. the Cowboys who they drafted, like, and you know yeah. they gave him a giant contract and he stunk. <laughs> the whole thing. I mean, that that's how I see him. All right, I'm going to ask you one last question here. Do you think this year will be turned around by the veterans or do you think there'll be the draft and the impact on the team will help the defense the most? The offense, like you said, there's so many superstars on that side of the ball right now. It's going to be hard for anybody to come in there and help anybody because they don't really need it. But on defense, will it be a rookie or will it be a veteran that they've brought in that will help solidify that defense and make them a top 15 team uh look i would i'd love well, the answer here's what i want to tell you and here's my prediction <laughs> right. oh, oh you this guy's too slick i can't no no i love that i'm gonna steal that All this right. is what i want but this is what i know <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so like because people because people often misinterpret when you when, when i say this is what i think they're gonna do people are like oh you want them to do i'm like no 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 hold on damn it that's not what I'm saying. That's smart, Mark, because you you make sure it lands right. Right. I just I want it to hit the ears, you know. So right between the eyes. So <laughs> when it when it, when it comes to what I want, I want the Eagles in the second round. Oh my! If you get me, um, uh, Edron Cooper. If you get me, Trot Junior. Hatchet. Right. If you get me those guys, Marcy Wilson, that kid, that NC State's pretty good looking player too. Right, you you get me someone like that. Oh man, I'm gonna have confidence in a, in a rookie announcing his presence with authority in the middle of that defense, okay? That's what I want. What's going to happen, it's going to be boring. The Eagles <laughs> are not going to draft someone. I I, look, I I would love to see them get a corner in that first round. And when I mention the linebackers, I'm talking about in the second round. But with that, with that number 22 overall, they're going to go in the way of an offensive lineman. They're going to draft Lane Johnson's replacement. Um. I would love to see him go to the cornerback position and get someone who I think would be a splash, but we all know they haven't done that since Lito Shepard. Uh, they're going to go that route. I, if they draft a corner, they're not going to take someone that's going to jump out there and be prime Darius Slay. They're not going to get someone who's going to be prime time. Certainly not. They're, they're not going to get that guy. They're, they're probably in the first pick in the 22. They're probably going to go off offensive lineman. They're probably going to go O-line. Um, so I would say to answer your question, then veterans is really what it's going to have to come down to to be the difference makers on this team from last year to this year. I think that's why that's why they got Chauncey Gardner Johnson. 
I think that's why they went the route of instead of maybe drafting a running back in the second or third round or in the fourth round, whatever, they went out and they said, all right, Kenny Gainwell, guess what? You're the number two, Saquon Barkley, you're the number one. They're going to depend on veterans the way they're going to depend on veteran coordinators to help right the ship this upcoming season. All right, I'm going to leave you with this here. Um, tomorrow's the 23rd of March. Um, I know you can read a calendar, thank you. Um, I just would like you to know that tomorrow is the last day that you can get your audition tape for the Philadelphia Eagle cheerleader. So when you talk to Big Bill, make sure that he uploads it because I know he's a big social media guy. Uh, By the way, I love Bill too. I do. Oh yeah. But I, no, no, no. I do. I, yeah. I act. He's a pies. We're no, we're you know. I'm not hating on an Italian yeah. guy. I'm giving you a, some help here to help because if you talk to him again, the 23rd, four o'clock Eastern time. It's the last time audition tapes can be uploaded onto the Philadelphia <laughs> Eagle website for the cheerleading squad. Right. And they like guys with big pom-poms. Okay. Make sure that that video is really cheering it up for old Nicky Pinocchio. Wow. And make sure, you know, he gets it in by 4 o'clock, and I hope you send a message to him because wow. I'm really looking out for him, and I'm really concerned that he might not get that in. You're a good man. You're a good man. <laughs> That I know, I know, I I know that you hate Italian on Italian crime. This is even more specific. You, no, you use guys are both Sicilians. All right, it's even it's more even, specific. It's even you see, I know this, and I found this out about Sirianni. He's a northern Italian, so he's Calabrese, and he's up there, so he's kind oh of oh oh. That is the most Sicilian thing you've ever said to me. <clears <clears <throat> you refer to say, Calabria. He's he's kind of like a Frenchman. So he's not really <laughs> like an Italian guy. He likes white. I mean, white sauce is okay on some stuff, but I'm more red sauce guy, and I'm down there, you know. All right. You know, my... Listen, when you're the when you're a Sicilian guy, you get kicked around in the head because you're at the end of the boot. What do Red, you want from me, man? Wow, that is that is the most Sicilian sentence I've ever heard. I swear <laughs> to God, I as my father, hundred percent Calabrese, both his parents from Maida Calabria, Italy, right by Catanzaro. Okay, yes, thirty sir. minutes. Thirty minutes. Yes, sir. To have that referred to as Northern Italy? How dare you, sir? <laughs> hey, uh, you you know you could have Nobly Don in you too. You know you don't oh, know. Don't you, you 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 back off. You back <laughs> off with that. You back off with a Napoli Don, please. <laughs> oh my God, man! I really love talking with you, Mark. It's a back at you, brother. Fun, man, I'll tell yeah, you man. what. I appreciate you so much. Have a great weekend, my friend. Thank you for coming aboard. Don't forget, check out his great show. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Mark. My pleasure. If I don't talk to you, Bona Pasqua, have a great Easter and all that fun stuff. You bet, my friend. Thank you so much, too. See you, bud. All good. That is Bona Fortuna to him. That's for dang sure. All good. Hit the like button. Keep it here, National Football Show.